Insecurity is one of the main reasons why people want to leave science. Hello and welcome to the Science for Societal Progress podcast. For this episode, I talk with Maria Pinto about the insecurities and uncertainties that especially early career researchers face in academia, whether they are thinking about leaving the ivory tower or not. My name is Maria and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Vienna at the Microbial Oceanography Group and I work with plastic eating bacteria. After we got to know a little bit about her work, we look at the graduate student and postdoc experience and talk about financial insecurities, the importance of knowing your worth, the discrepancy between founding a family while juggling two academic careers and the outlook of frequently having to move homes from country to country, and the harsh competition that makes it unlikely to land a long-term position even after a decade on the job. Overall, early career researchers are foregoing salaries, benefits, and planning security for their lives to enter a bitter competition for the few permanent positions that are available. Of course, the details vary between countries and even institutes, but overall, life as an early career researcher is not cozy. We don't present solutions here, but maybe we can do something to counter the stereotype of the spoiled academic. And if you want more information, don't forget to check out the show notes on our website, www.scienceforprogress.eu. It includes a summary and resources for further reading. As a little disclaimer, when we talk about leaving science, we mean academia. Of course you can be a scientist and also a researcher outside of academia. And with industry, we basically mean any non-independent job outside the ivory tower. I'm your host, Dennis Eckmeyer, and you are listening to episode 19 of the Science for Societal Progress podcast. Why move into a landlocked country to become a marine biologist? <laughs> um, that was a sequence of events, actually. So I did all my studies in Lisbon. It's my hometown. And I did all my, uh, my bachelor and my master's there. And then when I handed in my master's thesis, I had to wait a couple of months for um, uh, defending it. And I decided to come to Vienna for two months because my boyfriend is Austrian. So I came to Vienna to see him. And I didn't want to be here two months without doing anything. So I started working as a volunteer in the lab where I am currently working. And everything went well. I ended up getting a contract as an assistant for one year. And during this year, I wrote a PhD project for a scholarship that I then got. And that's how I ended up here. So it's actually a microbial oceanography group, but I did uh, marine ecology in my master's. And the topic from my master's thesis is, was completely different. But in the end, I really like what I'm doing now. But we have to go on expeditions to be able to collect samples because we are in a landlocked country. So where do you usually go to, to, to get your samples? Um, me personally, I go a lot to the North Adriatic. In the north of Croatia, there's an institute with whom we have a cooperation and they always host us there and we know the people and we know the boats that we can rent. So we go there a lot. But I have also been on research cruises because the focus of my group is the deep ocean. So they have to collect samples from the deep. So we have to go on cruises and this is all around the world. Oh, wow. But in the deep ocean, you also find plastic? No, I don't work I... at the deep. I'm an outlier in my group. I work with uh, microbial oceanography on plastics on the surface because it's, yeah, they, you can find plastics in the deep, but to collect it is really difficult. Yeah. Really, really difficult. They can't just bring you some samples since they're going down there anyways. No, you would have to be able to drag a very, very large volume of water to be able to collect enough material that I could use. Oh, I see. So that's why it's difficult to, it's, or if not impossible, I'm not sure to do that at the moment. Have you already identified plastic eating bacteria? It's on the process. <laughs> right now I have some uh, incubations and uh, I'm working on them and trying to work. I'm mostly working with genes and genomics. Since we recorded this episode, Maria opened a website to showcase science communicators for marine biology called Oceans for All. 
We, that is Science for Progress, partnered with her site, and you can find a link in the show notes. You will also find a link to her YouTube channel called C and Me. I wanted to do something with science communication, and I thought about starting a blog, but I'm not a very talented writer. So I am. Um, I watched a lot of science YouTube channels before, and my boyfriend said, "Oh, just start a YouTube channel." I don't know if he was being serious, <laughs> but in my mind, it stuck. And I started really, maybe that's not a bad idea. Um, and I started applying for voluntary jobs here in Austria, but because my German is not that good, and I would need to talk to in schools and everything, it was a bit difficult. So I just decided to start the channel, and it's been much more fun than I ever thought it would be. It's a lot of fun. And what do you talk about on your YouTube channel? I talk about my experiences as a PhD student, as a marine biologist, and I also do some scientific videos about specific topics that I think are interesting. In one of Maria's videos, she talks about how students and grad students in Portugal often have to pay for their work trips themselves. I know some people who don't have the support from their projects because the project has not so much money and they have to put money of themselves, for instance, for housing and for transportation because the the project does not uh, pay for that. Now, I'm not, it's not uh, the project by project, I mean the person who is behind the project. So the, the principal investigator just just won't pay it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I don't really know if it's because just the money is really not enough for, d depending on the type of research you do, but sometimes if you do a lot of molecular work, for instance, you need to uh, spend a lot of uh, resources in lab equipment and supplies and all these things are quite expensive. And then many times if you want to do some extra field work to collect more samples, you end up not having money and then you have to pay it from your own a pocket but this um I, i don't know if it's portugal specific i think it's depending on how much money there is in a country for research and how much you get per project i think it's not so much because uh it's just I, right now i only have these two countries to compare in terms of resources so austria and portugal and there's a such a huge difference that things that for me were normal when i was in portugal now i look back and like wow such a difference when you have money and when you don't. So yes, there is there is not enough funding in Portugal. But that also means that the students aren't paid a lot. Actually, the the salary, salaries of postdocs and students, unless they're in those private institutes where I have been, um, are not really great. And then they also have to pay for the trip. So in order to be able to do this, you need additional family support or savings. The average student may not necessarily be able to afford it, which means there is a bias favoring the wealthy. Exactly, especially for conferences. Um, for uh, for instance, here in Austria and even in Germany, I know a lot of people, it's normal to go to a conference outside Europe. It's because it's a man, most conferences in microbiology, not most, but many are in the States or sometimes in China or it's somewhere else. And um And if for me, it's already normal to hear people saying they're going to go to these places for a conference. But I, in Portugal or people I know who are doing research there, I mean, it's no one goes further than Europe because there's just usually no funding for that or they would have to pay it themselves. Sometimes people do pay it themselves. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's really a big, big difference. And also salary, it's an insane difference compared a PhD salary here in Portugal and the benefits you get is are completely different because here you have a contract as a PhD student a normal employee contract which in Portugal you don't because normally it's a scholarship so you don't pay taxes but then you also don't get any benefits here you you are considered an employee so you also get all the uh, health and social benefits Yeah, and that also plays into this whole insecurity thing, right? You you don't have proper contracts, and you don't you don't pay into social security. Maybe, I mean, you can voluntarily, but 
it's possible, especially for a PhD student, that it's not enough money. And if you had to pay the, I think it's 125 euros per month uh, for social security, if you can't pay that, then you don't. And yeah, that's that's problematic, right? Yeah, that is. Um, and uh, I think uh, in speaking again about Portugal, uh, I know that a postdoc salary, the, I mean, as a postdoc, you have so many responsibilities and you are basically are a specialist in your area. and We were talking about this today in the lab, so it's something that postdocs all also uh, think of a lot. You think uh, you look at the private sector and people who know maybe ten times less than you in a certain topic that are more general, but maybe but they earn uh, comparatively so much more than a postdoc could ever imagine. Even in even here in Portugal, it's even a whole other dimension. I think, and I think it's all over the world a bit like this. I think um, scientists are not are not known to be generally super well paid. Well, no, that's true, especially not in the public sector. Yes, not but, in the public sector. But here's sector. the thing. So here's the story that I was told when I was young in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So teenager deciding what to do next, right? Um, the the story narrative is. Um, you go into private in the, into the private sector to make a lot of money, and you go into the public sector to have a safe job. <laughs> you know, you work for less, but you'll have more job security. Yeah. And it turns out, no, the job security is just as bad. Yeah. Or worse, yeah. maybe it depends where you are, mm -hmm. and you don't get paid. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, what is the benefit? Our academic institutes are aware of the problems people are facing at the transitions between career stages. Thankfully, workshops to inform students are becoming more common. I just two, three weeks ago went to a workshop, uh, which is kind of related, called Ending a PhD, What Next? It was a kind of a workshop developed by the uh, doctoral school at our faculty. And they invited people from outside academia to say what they would be looking for in someone who would be applying to their company or NGO or something. So in that workshop, did they hand you a list of skills that every PhD has that they're not aware of? Or did you develop it in some sort of game? Or, or... Yeah, it was a very self-discovery. It was very interesting and kind of motivating. It was really... It was really nice. We were only 15 people, so we were all talking with each other and talking about what we learn as PhD students, project management, teaching, or how, how to deal um, with conflict, how to work in a group, how to work under pressure, how to organize your time, how to deal with failure, all these things that once you've realized, you think, yeah, that's true, but you really never think that that might be important somewhere else. And so we were just talking about examples where these tasks or these things that you learn throughout your PhD could be important. And I think even if you want to stay in science, these are good, good exercises to do, to be aware of your value. That was more or less the whole point, is to be aware of our value as professionals. And there was also a lady uh, who was uh, a coach, a scientific coach. And she was telling us, it appears that uh, there's equality being reached, that even in science, uh, it is, man, if there's someone looking at a CV and you are a woman finishing a PhD and you are between 30 and 35, they will think twice. Because they think that you are starting a family. Yes, because you will have kids and then you will um, not be all there for job for your work and uh, then the, and you'll not give the whole full priority to your job and so this still is quite a problem as well no one says it openly she knows because she works with people who are responsible for making decisions that sometimes they will they will think twice so that this is something that it's not as good as people think it is many of my friends not only women but men as well think a lot about this family uh, situation once finishing their PhD. A lot of people are considering not continuing in science because of the instability that it creates and the fact that that will not facilitate building a family. And that maybe when you finally have a 
a permanent position, then it's, uh, I mean, you're already too old. So did you talk about the differences? I mean, what are the men and women, do they have different problems? Normally, it's very dependent on whether or not they have a partner at the moment and how the partner is going to cope also with this instability. So this is also a big um, thing usually that I think plays an important role in deciding whether to stay in science or not. Funny enough, it does not seem to be dependent on women or men, at least here in the, the people I know. So it's quite, I already know people who left science who wanted to have stayed in science, main, mostly in Portugal, because they wanted to be able to stay in Portugal because of family or partners or whichever reason, and they just couldn't uh, find a job. They would have had to leave the country. So um, both men and women, actually. What is your impression of what it would be like for you as a marine biologist If you continue as a postdoc, what, what is your outlook? If I would not stay for a couple more, of more years in my lab, which could be, which is a potential possibility, not, not 100%, but would be in for the next two years, not forever. I would probably go maybe for a postdoc in the US or in Germany because it's where the labs that have groups that I'm interested, that work with topics that I would potentially be interested in. Um, and then it's a big question mark. Then I would real, I really don't know, but I guess for the next couple of years, I would leave Austria unless I would stay one more year in my lab. But I think because of contract things, I cannot stay more than one more year. Um, so then I would have to leave Austria or because it's the only one that works with marine, uh, micro, micro evolutionography here. So I would leave to another country for at least, yeah, I guess two or four more years. And then it's a big, so then I would really have no idea. Then I guess at the end of the postdoc, then I would have to decide where to go or what to continue, what to do. Did you already... Uh, gather some information about what kind of contracts you could expect if you go to the US or to Germany would it would it is it more common to have longer contracts or short term contracts it's short term two years is the common it's not enough for a study no it's two years postdoc two to three years um three but I saw, because I already, I, I am part of some mailing lists for position openings, and I saw some uh, on postdocs, and sometimes I check just to have an idea of what's out there. And it's normally for two years, yeah, in Germany and the States also the same, two years. It sounds like you would have to have a clear idea of what your experiments will be and what you can do in the lab before you even start. Because otherwise you don't have the time to do a full study in two years. I think usually what happens is uh, you come to to projects that are already being developed and you suddenly become part of it. And then you create your own project within this project if you are a new postdoc. Because I think also there's a lot of possibilities to extend then your... Um, um, your project or to apply to a new project and then you have more points when you apply because you say I already did these preliminary experiments and now I want more money to continue so that I can have results. I think a lot of people end up doing postdocs for four or five years in the same place. They manage to extend somehow the, the, the money and the grant and the project. But usually I think the initial plan is two years and then you can try to get more funding for continuing your research. It looks like for me one of the probably the most stressful times because you have to have so short time, period of time and you have to show what you're worth kind of so that you can then apply to new grants and, and ultimately get a um, permanent position somewhere. Let me throw in a short announcement. Science for Progress is free and accessible, however, in order to keep going and to continue and improve and grow, we need your help. You can find information on how to support us on our website 
www.scienceforprogress.eu if you follow the menu to your support. My sincerest thanks to those who are already supporting us, especially through Patreon. Every contribution helps, no matter how small. Now let's get back to our conversation. College graduates are usually in their mid-twenties. By the time they finish a PhD, they are at their late twenties to early thirties. Then follows postdoctoral work, often more than a decade. So people stick with these uncertain conditions for a long time at an age at which one usually founds a family before it becomes clear whether or not there will ever be a proper long-term contracted position for them in academia. Even if it's with 40 or 45 and you then get a permanent position, then you start developing your own research group until you finally have kind of your niche and everything established. It might take a while as well. And then you takes time to adapt to everything new. And it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you really need to be passionate about what you do. That's, I think, really the thing. You really have to like it. You must like it. And I like it very much. So, but um, I don't, I don't like the insecurity, you know, it's, and I don't think it's, you like it, you must like science so much that you don't care about your daily survival. I don't, I don't think that makes sense, right? That should not be the case. You should be able to know that you can live off it and do what, what you like. I mean, yeah. But the system is kind of built that way. Um, I think that you you have to the ones who stay are the ones who love science so much that they are ready to like give up all a big part of their lives for it. Of course, not everyone. Um, and a lot of people make it through with family. I mean, I know people who have family and have a good stable position. But it's not the majority of people who try. But of course, it can happen. And it doesn't mean that uh, everyone has to throw away all their life. There are scientists who have a personal life as well. But now I think because um, there are so many at, at the PhD level, there are so many people now doing a PhD. And the number of people who think about pursuing science as a career has increased so much that competition is, I think, growing so much that it ends up kind of being the people who give everything to science that stay and everyone else by their own mentality start dropping out because they think, ah, this is, I don't want the hassle. I don't want this. And yeah, and there, there is no, it's kind of uh, sad that uh, the, a lot of, that a lot of people give up because of that. So, so what are your plans? When you're done your actual plans uh i don't know <laughs> i really don't know um yeah so this is really close to my heart <laughs> right now this topic because uh definitely the job security is something that plays a big uh, part in my decision right now in terms of but not so much the two year plan to be honest it's more the Uh, idea that I might have to change the country I live in every two years and um, or every th three years or every four years and uh, I'm just not sure if I want that um, and it would be um, I think different if I would know that after five six years I would maybe get okay I can struggle through these years traveling around but I know that afterwards I will have a permanent position but even seeing people who are now yeah almost 50 and only now they're getting a permanent position it frightens me a bit in this sense um and yeah so I really don't know because I really like science and I really like what I do. And even if I don't stay in science, I would like to have some connection with the environment and science somehow, because I really enjoy it. So, and I'm enjoying my PhD. This is a good note to end this episode on. So let's summarize. For a PhD student, I think the main insecurities are, first of all, deciding whether or not you want to stay in science. If you want to stay in science, then dealing with the insecurity of not knowing where you will end up 
in some years from now. And then if you decide that you don't want to stay in science, is feeling insecure about your own abilities, kind of feeling like you're useless to do anything else. Um, I think this, I don't know if this might be a specific problem to biology and ecology. I don't know. Maybe if you do a PhD in chemistry or in fields where you might be able to apply more the techniques you use in the industry or other type of uh, companies, maybe you don't feel this so much. But in ecology, I f we, we feel this a lot, I think, because we we think yeah, who is going to care uh, in a company about the things we do. And there's a lot of insecurity in this. All these concerns are not new, but have been around and worsening for at least two decades. Very successful, award-winning senior scientists are on the record for stating that they would not have been able to have a career in academia under the current conditions. Others state that these conditions, in particular the harsh competition, have begun to hurt the advancement of science due to rising numbers of depression and anxiety among early career researchers. This situation pushes attention of the researchers towards their careers and away from rigorous scientific work. Some countries are trying to lift the burden through legislation, but this has not been particularly fruitful so far. I certainly would like to see the support for early career researchers adjusted to fit the level of education, professionality and dedication they bring to the table. At the moment the strategy seems to be to exploit the passion of scientists for their work, rather than rewarding it because it allows a larger, cheaper scientific workforce. For the summary and further readings, find the show notes to this episode on www.scienceforprogress.eu. This of course includes the links to Maria's new website, Oceans for All, and YouTube channel, See and Me. And check out the different ways you can support us by navigating to your support on our website. If you have questions, critique or suggestions, get in contact by email info at scienceforprogress.eu or on social media at scienceforprogress for Twitter and Facebook. Have a good day. Bye bye.